And 
the materials must be deposited in the working fuel pile and used within the prescribed time. Uh, and ultimately, if it'll be combusted, the pathogen will be inert as ash. Um, and then, in addition to our required BMPs, uh, I'm pushing for uh, further measures. Uh, we're going to transport the materials only during periods of dry weather. And uh, the, the transport vehicles are going to be dedicated for that task of uh, transporting materials from the staging area to the cogeneration facility so they won't be in contact with any native soil and will have reduced potential for transporting pathogens uh, in the soil capacity. And then uh, crews and equipment operators will be sanitizing equipment uh, in between sites all along the way. Thank you, Nick. Cody? I am not going to say that because I will fall off the stage. Um, <laughs> uh, like you said, I am Cody C. Pontus. I am the resource manager down in Midpen. And, uh, we have 63,000 acres, and uh, part of our mission is actually to continue to grow, and we are. Uh, we get uh, thousands of acres a year, adding to our lands that we already have. Um, in addition, in 2014, uh, we went out to the voters and got approved for a $300 million bond uh, to, one, buy more land, and two, to open these lands up to the public uh, by inputting uh, different parking lots, uh, bathrooms, trails, and such. And uh, with that, um, of course, we get a lot of uh, soil importation, uh, having to do restoration work uh, evolved around these areas. Um, we have to do mitigation. Um, and all these things uh, point to us having to do uh, revegetation to these areas. Uh, one of the things um, that is sort of critical to what we do is the fact that we have to do inventory and monitoring of our sites. Uh, what do we have? What are we trying to protect? Um, what are we uh, most nervous about in terms of our threats? And so uh, for the past couple years now, uh, we've been uh, funding a lot of different research, uh, and you've heard about a lot of that uh, in the past couple days, uh, the different research that Midpen is doing uh, in terms of sudden of death and other chakras. And so we're trying to get that understanding. Uh, what is our baseline? What is going on on our lands? And uh, over the next uh, year or two, uh, we are hoping to create these sudden of death um, response plans for certain preserves. Um, some of our preserves have been very heavily hit uh, with sudden of death. Uh, for example, our Bear Creek Redwoods uh, Preserve, which is right outside Los Gatos, uh, we just opened it up to the public on June 7th, um, and it has um, a lot of die off there. Uh, and due to that, uh, we have uh, increased fuel loads. And so there's a lot of concern, um, as there should be, in terms of fuels management. Uh, so for the past year, uh, the plan I've been working on is how do we mitigate uh, those fuel problems that we have. Uh, so uh, me, along with a, a, a really great team uh, of both uh, internal staff at Midland, along with Cal Fire and other fire agencies, and a couple consultants, uh, creating a wildland fire resiliency program. And part of that is to mitigate these fuels that we're seeing from um, all the uh, sudden of death that we have going on. Um, in addition, uh, sort of going in uh, tandem with this, is that we are reviewing our BMPs and we're reviewing all of our contract language. So we're gonna be going out to consultants uh, starting this year uh, to review our contract language to make sure that it is up to par. Uh, so when we are doing these trails, uh, these parking lot installations, uh, that we are following the best management practices um, and making sure that we're not doing um, more harm than we actually need to, uh, besides you know, paving over a uh, certain section of our lands. Um, so we're hoping to get those uh, PMPs in place um, and learn from other agencies uh, in the surrounding area what are they doing? What is working? What is not working? What's the most cost effective thing? Uh, part of what I have to do is to take the science um, and take the, um, 
what other agencies are doing and explain that to my board of directors to get them to fund uh, what we do. So, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do is in regards to uh, learning about that science and then implementing that science. Uh, so, uh, there's a uh, limited amount of information as of right now for Quetophthora. Um, and that is something that our board has agreed to, uh, you know, over the next 10 years to continue to fund research into Sudden Dog Death, uh, into the tunes of uh, $1 million over the next year to help out with that research going on, not only in our lands, but also in other lands uh, throughout the area. Thanks, Cody. Brendan? Let's see if I get this right. <laughs> the microphone here. Uh, so, I am Brendan O'Neill, and I am a land manager for the state of California. I manage uh, the Sonoma, Co Sonoma Mendocino Coast District, which is 23 park units uh, spread out over 52,000 acres. And I've been in the position for 19 years now. Uh, when I was a graduate student in Humboldt State studying forest pathology, we identified uh, one of the park units in Sonoma was identified as the first location for sudden oak death. Uh, that's Armstrong Redwood. It's actually Austin Creek State Recreation Area, uh, which is adjacent. And uh, I landed there in 2001, and I had the privilege of watching sudden oak death spread through the landscape in that time. And it's been um, uh, an eye-opening process to watch uh, ridge top to valley bottoms, uh, where your most park units were probably at about 85% mortality on uh, most of our stands with, uh, with Tanos. Uh, for the first few years, we noodled with uh, folks cleaning boots, uh, you know, trying to get folks to pay attention to spread of the pathogen via mud and water. Um, not a lot of success with that. A lot of our programming, uh, rather than the public outreach, has been since focused on um, maintaining, minimizing hazards for the public, removing trees that are symptomatic uh, from failure, uh, making sure that nobody, nobody gets hurt, uh, that we minimize structural damage and things like that. Um, so no death continues to spread throughout our districts. Uh, I've worked in Marin as part of my career as well, and uh, so. Sonoma, we've definitely had a, a spread from the interior to the coast. And in the last few years, one of our park units are Fort Ross, which had been sudden up got free for a surprisingly long time. Uh, in 2017, we started to see symptoms. I think we had nearly 100% mortality in some of those stands. It's been impressive. Um, I've linked up with Chris to help do some monitoring for park units, and uh, he's also a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for one of my forest management I'm working on. And uh, we're working with two forest management plans right now that both incorporate the sudden oak death management, another phytophthora. We have phytophthora in the moment. I remember more on both uh, present and our park units. And um, all of our plans will clearly be taking uh, minimization of pathogen spread into account. Um, we're looking at measures. Standard EMPs, cleaning equipment, uh, how disposition of woody material, um, how to, you know, be it chipping, burn piles. There's a lot of difficulty. A lot of the the uh, Cal Fire regs are written for the Sierra, and not necessarily for the coast. And so a lot of our it's challenging to meet some of our moisture requirements in our wood. I don't know if everybody's getting all this, but uh, for burn piles, uh, burn pile management can be a challenge. Um, I work with PG&E, I work with Caltrans, we have roads, utility crossings uh, throughout our park units, all potential spreads for pathogens. Uh, we have wild pigs everywhere that can spread <laughs> pathogens, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. A couple of pigs can do quite a good job of spreading pathogens. Um, there are many vectors, it's a challenge. Uh, we are evolving our approach to not just uh, phytophthoras, but other pathogens. It's, um, it seems insurmountable often. Uh, I wish I could say we had a silver bullet for this, but uh, we are deeply challenged by this. A lot of our landscape also, I think, is um, reflective of a legacy land use. So, for instance, our tanro stands are probably much, uh, had been in the last 20 years, a much higher proportion total vegetation type than 
they would have been historically. Uh, same is true with a lot of our we've, been, we've generally been all operating in a landscape absent of fire. So structure and composition of our of our stands is is uh, out of equilibrium for the most part. And uh, I hope that in the next few years, with the assistance of the new, newly available funds uh, from CAL FIRE and other sources, that we'll start to be able to address uh, forest health in a much more positive way than um, I think the, the mindset of the BAM, as I was called, the Bambi era, which was uh, you know, put the uh, boundaries around your park and, and leave it to uh, that's your conservation measure. So we'll, we'll see where we're headed. Thanks, Brendan and Jeremy. I can feel less. Um, <laughs> my name is Jeremy Moore. I work with uh, Santa Clara County Parks and Recreation Department. Um, we manage 28 regional parks and 52,000 acres in just south of Santa Clara County. Um, we have a lot of the same issues as state parks and the regional open space district. We actually share a lot of borders, including trail connections with Vinton. Um, I'm really happy because now I've just found my point of contact for my next <laughs> uh, But yeah, so we, we have the same, we have a lot of the same management programs um, as, as they've described, so I won't really go into a lot of detail of that. Um, what I worked on as a project manager was a forest health plan for Mount Montgomery County Park. Um, Mount Montgomery County Park is roughly 75 miles south of here on the southeastern edge of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, Sudden so Oak Death uh, has not been confirmed there, although it's highly suspected, but we've uh, had significant outbreaks um, of uh, mycophthora and our malaria. Um, and uh, to show how slow government works, our first outbreak was in 2001, uh, and it resulted in the removal of roughly 750 trees um, due to public risk um, and failures of root, tree, uh, and trunk failures during the middle of a busy summer area, so we had to close the campgrounds for the entire summer. Um, we started a tree safety program similar to state parks as a result of that. It happened again in 2012, and we took out 500 trees. Um, and so in 2012, that's when we started looking at our tree hazard mitigation, we only looked at the symptoms, not the actual cause. Um, so uh, we started the effort in 2012 to finish, to do a course health plan that was finished this year. Um, and so that plan was to address um, the both the resiliency of the forest as well as um, the heavy fuel loads that have been built up over the years. The property was first purchased in 1928, I believe, and so it was a heavily logged property, and then logging was stopped. And so there was no plan to go from logging to slowly integrated back into something that was more manageable. So we have the same thing where we have uh, unnatural fuel, uh, tree stands that you wouldn't really expect. We have tan oaks that are directly you know, 80 feet tall and straight as a, as a telephone pole. Um, and so as a result, we've had mass tan oak, tan oak die off. So we worked on the forest health plan um, with consulting registered professional foresters um, from DUDEC. I have to plug that because they're and so our forest health plan looked at diagnosing some of the issues that were there, breaking up our park into manageable plots or manageable regions where we had similar ecotypes or similar pathogen um, presence. And then from there, establishing you know, full forest resiliency through reduced competition, um, as well as fire prevention measures. So that includes shaded fuel breaks, uh, invasive species removal, uh, reinstituting prescribed burning, so we have a burn pit, it hasn't been used for 10 years, we're going to reinstitute that burn pit so that we don't have to um, export materials. Um, there really is no place to export materials in the Bay Area. Um, there are very few cogen plants, um, so you really have to deal with what you have on the ground. There's no way to get rid of it um, except with what you have um, in your park. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that's about covers it. So, um, you guys have spotlighted some problems of management at large scale, insufficiency of funds, and, and other themes that I see that I'm not going to articulate right now because I don't want to send the, the conversation in any one direction. What I was 
hoping that we can do now is send the microphone around. If anyone has questions or comments for discussion, we can start that discussion and these guys will pass the microphone around as they need to. So have at it. Okay, so you guys, you guys talked, some of you talked about um, putting in place EMPs or mach heavy machinery, and I'm just curious what, what do some of those entail? Or if you, if you have them, what do they entail? Uh, so, um, as I was describing, uh, we're going to be doing a mitigation tree project coming up um, this September, uh, where we're removing uh, one and a quarter acres of cultivar tree. And then we're going to be installing uh, about 40 tree bases into the area. Um, for them to do this work, uh, we wrote into our contract um, that the, all the vehicles need to be cleaned before arriving on site. Um, we are asking that uh, there's no dirt, no um, plant material, um, no mud, nothing like that on the material or on the heavy equipment. Um, and they also have to provide documented photographic proof that they've also um, have applied uh, either isopropyl um, alcohol um, or something similar that uh, is commonly used uh, to do sanitation. Uh, we won't be doing wet ops. That's one part of it. And then the other part is uh, right now I'm also watching with interest uh, one of the UC Extension forestry forestry folks up in Humboldt County is doing some work on uh, how to uh, sterilize equipment for specifically for working with toddlers. So uh, thank you, UC. Keep up the good work. And uh, we'll be watching you. Uh, one of the other things that we do is we have dedicated equipment for the parks with known pathogens. So we have dedicated chipper, dedicated chainsaws. Um, all of our vehicles stay on site. Vehicles off site are supposed to be clean before they do it as for our internal. And all of our internal policies also apply to any contractors or anyone doing work on the property, and that includes um, you know, special use permits for people doing um, anyone doing biological surveys or anything like that. They are still required to follow the same measures. I want to clarify what um, Brendan is referring to really quick before you um, we get to you, Carrie. Um, UC Extension in Humboldt County is, is testing. Uh, how you best clean off um, tracks of dozers and skid steers. And so they're testing a variety of different treatments from compressed air to hot water to cold water to um, some other things. And um, we'll see how that goes, but I'm glad that they've um, gotten to be funded by the Forest Service to do that study. That'll be good. Okay, sorry, Gary. Yes, we have um, a couple of different cogeneration facilities that we're uh, working on contracts with. Uh, so we'll have uh, at least one in Yellow County and one in Foster County. Uh, of course, that distance is quite large. Uh, and uh, one of the concerns, in addition to being a vector for pathogens and transport, is uh, carbon and death. And it's uh, pretty close to a draw. Uh, moving all the material over and then recovering electricity from the gut carbon. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there's a very, very few number of facilities in the state and 
unfortunately, um, they're all located a great distance from the project area. I think that the, the, I would welcome other comments or questions about this biomass and woody material utilization question, because it's a really important one, not just for sudden oak death and other phytophthora management, but for um, the bark beetle um, outbreaks that we've been having and other forest health issues. Um, public perception plays a part in this. Um, I do recall that the California Oak Mortality Task Force in its early years was exploring this question and we had uh, a couple of experimental yards that were open to receive woody material. And so if anybody who was involved with that might um, tell us if anything was learned from that. If anybody knows anything about the bigger political uh, uh, climate with re relation to that question, we'd love to hear from you. Any thoughts? Just really briefly, it's also affecting almond production in the valley as well. And that people don't know what to do with the almond wood, and potentially they're spreading almond wood rot pathogens around the, the valley because they can't just burn it. There must be a reason that those cogen plants are not functioning there. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, it's a, it, it is a really fraught political and public perception issue. Um, I know that some. Um, biomass generation plants in Humboldt County have been closed because uh, the community didn't want them there. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and there's not necessarily a widespread appreciation of how they can help us manage forest health issues in the state, I think. And that, that ag issue is a really important one to bring up. I'd like to add to on um, conservation lands, oftentimes we don't have a road network that's sufficient to haul logs to, so uh, you know, industrial timber land is a lot different than conservation land. And, um, maintaining a, an active road network is a big cost to anybody, uh, especially one that meets uh, regional water quality control board and fishing game standards. Uh, so, in a lot of cases, we can maybe remove some logs for cogen on the periphery of a lot of our properties, but when you get into some of the internal locations uh, or interior locations, I mean, there's no cost efficiency there for us to do that. I've been spoiled with my project being uh, largely accessible by some sort of service for access road uh, in the greater part of the project area. Uh, but an obstacle that I have encountered is uh, because the cogeneration facilities have to maintain their California Air Resources Board permit, uh, they will often only accept clean chips, that's uh, wood chips that are free of like leaves and needles, uh, any other non woody debris. And depending on the job site, that may be difficult to achieve. And then you have materials that you, you can't send to that facility. Um, I have a friend who is um, one of the members of a 5,000 acre ranch in Western Sonoma County and they have uh, forestry lands and they do harvesting. They're very involved in making it a resilient, healthy forest. They also have vineyards and they have cattle. And so recently uh, they bought a biochar machine, which is kind of nice because of the, they can use the ash. The cattle can kind of put it down. <laughs> um, and they're also going to have uh, a small group of people who work for them, who know how to use the machine, and it's small enough that it can be taken from place to place. So that could be another idea, to have a smaller machine that can be moved. I know that in the uh, southeast, um, there's a company that has uh, created these very large, I think they're called uh, curtain flamers. Curtain flamers. Curtain flamers. Yeah, thank you. Um, and they're about the size of a, um, a container. Um, and uh, we are looking into possibly getting one of these. And uh, it burns very clean. Uh, it takes, uh, I think it, it, it brings it down to 3% uh, of the original biomass. Um, and it burns very, very hot. So that's one of the options that we are looking at is uh, these, these cooking rooms. Uh, we've got three of them. 
So uh, they, uh, they're great, once again, for developing areas. And anything in the wildland is a challenge. You need equipment to move them. Uh, every time we've used them, we've had the Air Board folks come out skeptical. They leave satisfied. Uh, but it's a small percentage of the landscape that we can use to work on air curtain burners. Uh, the biochar is great. We're, we've noodled with it a bit. Uh, the last UC Cooperative Extension workshop I was at on fire, uh, there was, um, you know, I'm not, I hate to burst your bubbles, but biochar doesn't appear to be the answer either. I think there's a lot of little things we need to start doing, and it's very site specific and time specific as well. So um, that's really what we're looking at as a combination of methodology that's appropriate for the areas. One of the things that we've done a lot of over the years as well is um, we do small burn piles using craft paper, which is a, a great technique. It's a uh, wax impregnated paper, four foot uh, width. We cross our piles, we top our piles with this, keeps your piles dry. Uh, during wet weather events, you can burn really easily. And uh, it's not exactly, you know, we're, all these issues, every method we have for disposal of material has its issues, I'll, I'll be clear. So there's no perfect solution. And I, uh, just speaking about that, I, I think that's true of any decision we make when we are doing any land management. Um, each one of our decisions has a pro and a con, and that's just something that we have to take into account. Um, and making sure we understand what those pros and cons are. Uh, this is true even with like invasive species. There's pros and cons of using herbicide versus manual versus mechanical methods. Uh, so it's something that uh, we need to be aware of. That's part of where uh, the science can really help out land managers is letting us know uh, what are those unintended consequences that we do not uh, realize. So a couple of questions. So um, going back to this morning, some of the presentations, when you're doing on these large tracts of land, how are, where are you sourcing your revegetation material? What, what, are, what kind of standards are you holding your growers to? Or have, are you growing your own, getting more into that? Or, um, you know, when you're replacing trees and, and things like that? Since I don't um, so, uh, we uh, were uh, very much active um, a while back about getting our, our plants from different nurseries, native plant nurseries. Uh, when Phytophthora sort of reared its ugly head, uh, we put a moratorium on, on getting any new plants and went to a lot of seeding. Uh, even now, we try to seed um, as much as we can, uh, but some of our permits don't allow us to do that. Um, you know, uh, we can get permits um, requirements that would be like, you know, we have to plant 15 gallon trees um, and we have to talk with the regulators and try to get them to either get us a smaller uh, uh, tree size or uh, if we can get to do direct seed. Uh, but we have worked uh, hand in hand with our main um, nursery um, to implement a lot of EMPs and testing a lot um, of their stuff. Uh, MIMPAN is part of that uh, accreditation program, um, you know, helping get Next Start started. Um, and so uh, working with uh, our nonprofit partner, Grassroots Ecology, uh, making sure those DMPs are in place and testing uh, as much as we possibly can. We only plant when required by uh, mitigation measures. Uh, I rarely do any out planting of any type. We have a fairly robust seed bank and source material adjacent to our sites. And we've found with almost every instance, we've had fairly successful revegetation of our sites without having to bring in new material. But that's unique to our situation. Most of the places I'm working on are, um, you know, like a former Christmas tree farm, I think was the example. I don't know, that might be a site that we would have taken similar measures, but for the most part, the, the properties I manage. Those are issues that we're dealing with addressing at this point. Uh, we pretty much have a similar, stand, a similar situation. Most of our parks are pretty well built out. Um, we, uh, additional facilities and trails we put in are usually um, located so we have the, the least impact possible. Um, we have the luxury that we have a lot of native sea banks that we will periodically save the weed we have. We also have a tree farm. Um, and so, uh, we are just slowly scaling back the tree farm and, and protecting 
protecting and allowing the natives to keep coming up occasionally when we need to. And we just slowly have been whittling that back over the last 10 years. So it's just a more of a phased implementation instead of this uh, massive disturbance and then having to re-bench. Um, and for us, it's, it's worked well, it worked well 